You wake up in the morning, the bank's fine, but somebody gets nervous and they run down and take all their money out. And somebody sees them and go, what are you doing? So I'm getting my money out of this bank. Okay, I better get my money out too. Next, and everyone's like, I don't want to be the last one out. Next thing you know, there's a line around the block. And by the end of the day, the bank shuts its doors and they're bankrupt. Um, but they weren't bankrupt at nine o'clock in the morning. It's, it's because a story spread. Uh, people believed it. People acted on it. And that's the key. Do you act on the story? You can make the thing you're worried about come true, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't true when the story started. And, mm -hmm. um, and by the way, that in the 19, that actually happened in the 1930s, or, but there was no social media, but there's word of mouth. I mean, we've had, that's social media. It goes back through the uh, length of civilization. So, um, uh, and then he had, you know, some great narratives about the, you know, the, the first, the first half of the great depression, 29 to 32, yeah, unemployment was high and the output was down and it was bad. Banks were shutting, but not everybody was unemployed. Not every business was shut. But if you if you had a job or you had a business or you had money or you're wealthy, it was bad form to spend it. It was like, well, mm -hmm. you know, my neighbor's laid off or my friend's business is yeah. shut. I don't want to be out buying a new car right now. It looks bad. Um, but then when Roosevelt was elected in 33, 32 is election, but 33 is sworn in. It flipped. It was like, hey, happy days are here again and go out and spend the money. And the economy actually grew between 33 and 36. The Fed screwed it up again in 37, but but it grew and the stock market went up from 33 to 36 in the middle of the Great Depression. But his point was um, the narrative that it was bad form to spend money or you better go spend money, two different, two opposite narratives, but a flip from one to the other, but they both drove the economy. Nothing would have been better in 1930 for pe then for people to go spend money because yeah. that would have increased aggregate demand. So that's, that's a classic case study, but what, so I kind of knew a lot of that, but what I learned um, is that narratives can be true. Sometimes often they are, but they can be false. In other words, a completely false narrative can be extremely powerful if enough people buy into it. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm saying about the fed pivot. The fed pivot is a narrative and it went like this. Um, so inflation takes everyone by surprise in last fall, late 2021, November, 2021, Jay Powell says time to retire the word narrative. He actually said that in mm -hmm. transitory, sorry, transitory. So time to retire mm -hmm. the word transitory. I think he said that in some congressional testimony. Uh, and then inflation goes to the roof, January, February, March, April, the stock market goes down. NASDAQ started going down actually in, in last November, Dow, S&P start to go down in, uh, uh, January and we're in a bear market by by June. Um, it's still going down. But then after the Fed raised rates in March, uh, May, and June, the, and then the yield curves inverted, and some people mm -hmm. weren't looking at them, but some people were. Uh, the narrative is like, well, wait a second. The yield curve inversion is telling us that rates are going to be lower six months from now. Inflation's cooling off a little bit, and it has. You know, the price of gas has come down mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, and so they're going to have to cut rates. That was the pivot. They're going to have to cut rates in January, February. Right. And rate cuts are good for stocks, so buy stocks. So then it's right. like, well, then we get this rally in July and August, and the stock markets, you know, recovering a lot of this, not all the lost ground, by the way, but, but a lot of it in the stock market's yeah. rally, all based on the Fed pivot narrative, which I never bought into. I mean, I, you don't want to stand in front of a moving train. I wasn't going to short the S&P, but I, right. I did not buy into the narrative. I said, for, for two reasons. Number one, Oh, inflation came down from nine to eight. Well, that's nice. But you're, you say you want to get it to two. You're a long yeah. way from two. And how much demand destruction, how many rate hikes, uh, how much do you have to do to really destroy the economy to get inflation down to two? The answer is a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. And tell me why that's good for stocks. And It's not. Right. Uh, but, but the other reason is, and this is a little more sophisticated analytically, but just because the yield curves are telling you that market pros think rates are going to be lower. It doesn't mean the Fed's going to cut. I mean, yeah. th that is the message, but it doesn't mean the Fed's going to get the message. How many times does the Fed get things right? The answer is never. So, Zero, exactly. So, <laughs> and, and then, of course, this call comes to head, I think, August 26th at, at Jay Powell's Jackson Hole speech. I've never heard a Fed chairman, I've been following this a long time, never heard a Fed chairman use the word pain twice in the same paragraph, but he said, this is going to cause pain, it's going to be very painful. Uh, and then, so that kind of burst the bubble of the pivot narrative, 
And then the stock market goes down, I think, six straight days. They get a little, so what's going on now? I don't know. Maybe a little short covering, maybe, you know, the, the buy the dips crowd have not gone away. They're still around. Um, the, the, uh, I'll say talking heads, uh, I guess I'm one, but, you know, the, the cheerleaders, I'll put it that way. Uh, the Wall Street cheerleaders have never gone away. The Wall Street always wants to sell you something. The, um, the people who think the Fed knows what they're doing, there's some of those, a lot of those actually. <laughs> yeah. on Bloomberg. Um, and, uh, and so, and the buy the dips crowd. So yeah, okay, but, but the fundamentals have not changed. The uh, recession is here, or if, it, if, if, it's, if the, we get a little breathing room, it's gonna go down really hard this winter, all the problems we talked about. And most importantly, Jay Powell told us, I would say that uh, forecasting the consequences of Fed policy is really difficult, but forecasting Fed policy is the easiest thing in the world because they tell you what they're gonna do. Yeah. You, just, uh, you just have to listen and know there's, there's a little, so you need a decoder ring, there's some secret language and you gotta know who the, they, they always have a reporter du jour. There's one reporter right. that they leak to. In the old days, when they, before they did this, it, it was primary deal or economists, you know, like, you know, great guys like Lacey Hunt and, you know, people at Aubrey Lanston and, you know, some of the lesser known primary dealers. The Fed said nothing publicly. They were black hole, but they would leak it to their favorite primary dealer of the week. Um, and you could kind of front run the Fed legally because they're part of the government uh, for a while. <laughs> Now they do it through reporters, but right now it's a, a Nick Timiaros of the Wall Street Journal. So if I read it in USA Today, I, I throw it in the trash. But if I if Nick Timiaros says seventy five basis points, I'm like, okay, seventy five basis points. That's right. But the hard part is is what's going to happen as a result of that, and the Fed's thinking maybe hard landing, but not too bumpy. Uh, and I'm thinking more like a plane crash. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I mean, I'm just blown away by their complacency about raising rates. I mean, we um, people give me a hard time for saying this, but on a percentage basis, it's true. The Fed has never raised rates this aggressively in this short period of time in history, not even during Volcker. I mean, he doubled Fed funds. Um, you know, they've taken it up tenfold in less than six months. And the idea that the level of rates is still low is obviously irrelevant because all the companies who are borrowing at those record low rates are going to have to roll their debt at substantially higher rates. So, you know, it seems to me like there's this overwhelming complacency, both on the part of the Fed and then the people who are buying into this pivot thesis that, well, you know, we'll get through this, it'll be short and shallow, and the Fed will pivot, and we'll be right back to the rates. <laughs> well, you're, you're exactly right. And assuming they do 75 basis points since September 21st, which is my forecast, but like I say, the Fed kind of told us, um, right. now you're at um, the target rate for Fed funds is now 3%. Three. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, sorry, three and a quarter, but uh, at, at the top of the range. But... Um, <laughs> It was zero on March 1st. So for people to say, oh, three and a quarter doesn't sound that high. It was zero on March 1st, three and right. a quarter percentage points in, uh, eight, in eight months or less. Uh, that's unbelievable. And they got two more meetings this year. And even if, you know, you could say 50 basis points in November, because it's, you know, three working days before the election, they don't want to be too, you know, Jay Powell may, You're be, a right. Jay Powell may <laughs> be a Republican, but he's, but he's, smart enough to know the fed wishes they could keep out of politics now they can't and they don't 